Alright guys, well, hello, and I think we're good, good to go. How's it going, Daniel? Uh, yeah, so, basically, I've been pretty busy, haven't been able to do a stream for the last, last weekend, but we're back on schedule. Hey, it's a Megs, hello! <laughs> Slowly getting my, 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 uh, my stuff together. So, today I just want to do a bit of, uh, answer some questions, I get asked a lot go through a, uh, a quick walkthrough on a uh, few slicing settings that I get asked all the time. So maybe you might be able to help some of you guys understand some of the more detailed settings in your slicing engine, specifically the latest version of Simplify 3D, which is version 3.1, which has just come out a few days ago. Uh, we got Bojan. Hello, how's it going? Uh, got a couple of parts and updates on the 404 villain. I don't know if you may have seen two weeks ago I started reverse engineering the, the 101 Hero 3D printer on Kickstarter. Uh, there's been a bit of controversy around that printer. Some people have been saying that the updates are just pictures from the original start of the campaign and people are getting a bit worried. To be honest, I, I backed the 101 Hero just as a bit of a bit of a joke to see how the story goes. It is a extremely low cost printer and they do have their work cut out to make it actually come to market. So I know my video on the 101 Hero probably drove a lot of people to pledge for it. But again, keep in mind that it is extremely low cost and even if it does deliver, it might not be very good. But the first story I just want to bring up very quickly is going back to Olo. And this is... You know, there was the original Kickstarter campaign I started talking about. And the reason I'm talking about Olo is they've updated... They've they've made an update on their page. They went basically radio silent. Their last update was May the 6th. And they started a, a backer kit. And then they just went dead. Nothing was being answered on emails. From what I understand, there was nothing being answered in Twitter updates. And then they posted this. Which is got pictures... Of them supposedly testing out new resins on the Olo, which is pretty cool. And yeah, I mean, I still think the idea of a smartphone 3D printer is a bit ridiculous. But maybe, maybe they're legit. I don't know. Some people have already said in the comments that they recognize this as being Formlabs resin. I don't know if it is, but <laughs> it would be funny if it is. But I def that, that orangey one is definitely Daylight Cure Resin. So, yeah. Pretty interesting for them to come out of the shadows. Um, they've added a USB cable because having batteries was pretty ridiculous to power a 3D printer. But, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah. A couple of questions. Let's close that off. So... Uh, so, James Newman asked on YouTube... Uh, or YouTube or Patreon, I forgot. Uh, out of curiosity, have I found any tools to splice filament together? So this is actually a pretty good question. So imagine you've got an end of a roll. You've only got maybe a few meters left and you want to, you don't want to waste that plastic. You want to join it together to another piece of plastic to feed through your printer continuously to continue along. Or maybe you want to join two different colors together so you get a gradient change. And there was a Kickstarter project for it ages ago but I don't know where that went. The biggest issue you have is when you're joining two filaments together, they are precisely 1.75 millimeter diameter or precisely 2.85 or, or three. 2.85 millimeter diameter would be the other standard. So they need to be exactly that size, otherwise your filament extruder will jam up. So when you're melting things together, keeping that consistent is difficult. So you either have to have a form which will constrain the diameter as it's cooling difficult to do, or you shave off the excess as you push two melted ends together, they'll make a little, like a little sort of blob around it, you need to shave that off. But this idea does exist and it has been pushed further into this, which is Mosaic Manufacturing's palette, which is essentially a filament feeder with four different rolls and it will melt and splice them together, uh, computer controlled, and then feed them through a single extruder to give you multi-color multi prints of one extruder. So they did have, I think Norm from Tested, if you go over to the Tested YouTube channel, he is interviewing the guys from Mosaic Manufacturing talking about their machine. 
it is not cheap. It's about a thousand dollars, but it does have four very large, or is it? Very large stepper motors inside, driving each filament. So there's a lot of hardware in there, and it it can be done. But at the moment, if you're just trying to join end end rolls together, then it's not really worth your time trying to make them work like that. You can sometimes feed them in one after another, but I would just, to be honest, move on and use the other bit just for smaller prints. Stuff like that. Uh, where's that chat window? Yeah, that looks good to me. Cool. So there's that. And another thing I get asked all the time about is um, Simplify 3D. And the is it worth it for a start? And also just in generally general for slicing algorithms and slicing settings and all of that. Like what do you do? So Simplify 3D does not have a demo. That it is it is paid software. They do have a two week like money back guarantee. So if you buy it and then you don't like it, um, or you find that your printer's not compatible, which is rare, but they, there is some printers that don't work with it, they will refund your money. So it is no risk in that regard, but there is no demo. So I just want to quickly fire up um, Simplify 3D and show you just some basics of how it works. So firstly, under the configuration assistant, that's kind of where they've really, really worked hard on. Uh, if your printer is not in this list, it may still work if it's based sort of off a, like a Marlin firmware based off a ramps board. This is a ramps board, by the way. It will probably still work with Simplify 3D. But otherwise, if you have like an UP or a Zortrax or a Cubicon, maybe might work with a Cubicon. If it's a closed source system, you're probably not going to get it to work with Simplify 3D. If you're in doubt, just ask them. So I'm going to pull down this list. Um, actually, just before I go into it, worth looking, be, be very creative, be the first. That's that, which is currently printing away and I'm testing at the moment. It's a Portuguese 3D printer, which is cool. They don't just make delicious chicken. <laughs> and you can see they've added the Cocoon Create, which is actually just a Wan Hao i3, but now it's in, in there as a Cocoon Create, which is handy for newcomers. Oh, Brandon, that's okay. So Brandon's in the chat saying he's have to leave in a few. That's all good, dude. I, um, I will talk about cleaning filaments in another video. I was going to do it today, but I don't know where they've gone. Yeah, so Mikos is saying flash, forward, flash print's just as good as Simplify 3D. I would agree. Actually, um, flash print's become very, very good, but I looked at using it for different print volumes and you can't really adapt it. It's sort of set. So I can't really use it because I don't have any flash forges. But anyway... So the thing that confuses people about Simplify 3D is these processes. And each process can have a complete different set of rules. But for this, I just want to show you what I care about in terms of what I look to change in terms of setting up prints. So firstly would be the nozzle diameter. Is your nozzle diameter correct? 0.4 is pretty standard. And then extrusion multiplier, that controls the flow rate of how much plastic comes out. So usually this is one. And it depends on the extruder design. If I am printing with a Flexion or something, I will probably make that one. It seems to be 0.9 defaulted because the one house have the Mark 10 extruders. Uh, if you're finding that parts aren't very strong, you might want to increase this value. I don't touch anything else. Everything else is fine here. Layer, that includes how high your layer is and how many outside walls and top and bottom faces it has, uh, layers. <laughs> uh, so, again, there's a big myth about how fine you can go. If you're buying a 3D printer, you might see advertised, oh, buy it, at, you know, it has a 20 micron layer height. Don't do it. It's, no one ever prints at 20 microns. It's ridiculously low. 100 would be the lowest I ever go, to be honest. 200 is perfectly fine. And don't forget that 100 takes twice as long as a 200 millimeter, sorry, 200 micron layer, layer height print, <laughs> if not longer. So that's your layer height. And the rest are pretty self-explanatory. Top solid layers, how many layers it has at the top. If you're finding there's obvious holes in the top of your print, you want to increase this value. Bottom solid layers, if you're finding the bottoms pulling off when you're taking it off the print bed, 
increase this value. And if you're finding your prints are delaminating, like they're not very strong, increase the outside perimeter. So two is the lowest you'd ever go. One is not high enough. And you can go all the way up to six if you want something crazy strong. But I usually stick with two or three. Uh, Jacob's asking, are there any other slices that can do a vase? That's a, that's a good question. So vase mode is a unique printing method where it'll cut the top off a object and just print the bottom, the base and the outside perimeter in a continuous spiral manner. So Cura can do it and Simplify 3D can do it as well. So single outline corkscrew printing mode. When you tick that, it overrides all of this stuff, including your infill. Uh, so infill obviously is how dense your part is. 20 again, you, you don't need to print solid at all. It's a waste of time unless you need the strength. Just, you know, 20 is probably more than enough. Some prints you can get away with nothing. <laughs> JTTV is saying he always prints at 100 because he has the time. I don't have any time. I usually print at 0.225 or something. I'm just so lazy. I'm so impatient. I want it done as soon as I can. So there you go. That's, that's what I'd usually change. And then this is important, skirt or brim. This is what confuses some people in Simplify 3D. So the, the skirt, otherwise known as a brim, can usually help parts hold down to the platform, but that's only if it's touching the part. And by default in Simplify 3D, it's offset. So you get like a pre-extrusion around the part and then it will print the part. So it's good if your nozzle leaks a lot. So when it's warming up, it drips to make sure that material is flowing properly when the part actually starts. But if you're looking to get better adhesion to your print bed, if you're finding things are warping off, then you might want to make the offset zero and then make it have maybe four outlines or maybe even more. And it'll add like a skirt around your part to help it stick down. And infill, there's lots of different settings. I don't really change anything from rectilinear. That just works fine for me. And temperature, again, if you're just printing with defaults, PLA or ABS, don't bother changing this, it'll be fine. You might need to increase the temperature if you're finding it's not working properly. But again, the defaults in, in the Simplify 3D are pretty good. The only other thing a lot of people miss is the advanced tab. Sorry, the other tab, my mistake. Uh, the default printing speed. And this is really, really important. It's how fast your printer moves. So machines like the Wanhao i3, the lower cost i3 kits, when they print too fast, they vibrate violently and you'll get very, very bad artifacting um, where the, art the vibrations get, get recorded essentially in the print. So you get walls that are wavy as it comes out of turns, it sort of goes blah, 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 and the vibrations translate into your 3D print. So if you're getting that issue, you can turn your printing speed down. So you know, 3,660 millimeters a second, you can make it uh, half that, so like 1,800. No, nope, that's 180. <laughs> So like 1-800. And if you have the time, again, if you have the time, you can print very slow and you'll get a better result. Uh, and one last thing is the preview. So you just go to prepare to print and it will show you a time estimate, material estimate, and what the print's gonna look. So you can go back and forth and change those settings to make sure you're getting what you want. And then you can go into your program. So that's basically all I'm going to talk about a Simplify 3D today. And this is this is applies to most other slices as well. It's a trial and error process, but hopefully those settings get you on the right track. <laughs> so I get asked that question a lot. So hopefully this stops it being asked a lot. Cool. So let me just go through the questions and see what I've missed. Uh, so Electric Plasma is asking, anyone know how to convert STL to IGIS? So that's a really, really tough one because you can, but they're two different disciplines of 3D model soft 3D modeling um, files, essentially. They're a mesh file and something that's mathematically based and driven. So you get mathematically driven curves and things like that. If you go from a, if you go from an IGES to a, a, a STL, it's very easy. So what you'll get is you'll get your cylinders converted into many triangles, which is what an STL is. It's, it's made up of lots of triangles in 3D space. To go from a 
triangle-based mesh to a an IGIS or a STEP or any of those sort of parametric modeling software formats, you, you're going to have to use some sophisticated um, conversion software to kind of guess what should have been there and convert it back into surfaces. So that's not 100% true. Uh, if you have a very low polygon count, it might just convert each triangle into a surface and you can do that in like SolidWorks if you just bring in a low polygon count triangle, uh, low triangle count STL, it might just let you open it as a solid. But otherwise, you need some really sophisticated software like uh, uh, iMaterialize have Geomagics, or you need the Scanda 3D plugins for SolidWorks. Basically, unless you pay money, it's kind of not possible. And I'd love to be proven wrong, but I worked in this field for a while, and we had to convert scans into SolidWorks data that we could then model on, and the only way we could do that was by spending lots of money. So that answers that question. So I just I G E S. It's a it's a CAD format, a parametric file format. Not I G U S, which is dryland bearings that I think Tom talked about in a video recently, which are very cool. Yes, and my name is Angus. Nice to meet you. Right. So that's that, and a update on the four hundred four villain. So this is this is going to be cool. So. I haven't worked anymore on the 3D model CAD itself. I just haven't had time, but I've got some parts to show you in terms of what what I'm going to be using. So this is a ramps board. So for those who haven't built a 3D printer before, you might not have seen one of these. So you can crack it open, get it off without breaking the pins. Uh, these are always so ah good. So it's literally just an Arduino Mega. This is all Chinese clones. These are really cheap on eBay. So the Arduino Mega plugs into this, which is a ramps board. And this has five stepper drivers on it. So it lets you drive up to three axes because you can usually, if you have two motors on the Z, you can slave them to one uh, stepper driver. So X, Y, Z or Z. And you have up to two extruders, so one and two. You also have a, a FET, MOSFET for the heated bed. So this can drive a heated bed as well. And this is an all-in-one solution for making your own 3D printer. And they used to be like $200, and now they're like $30 on eBay. So yes, the quality is shocking. Um, I would expect these to blow up maybe one in 10 batches. You'll get one that just explodes, uh, the, the driver that is. But they're really cheap. So for the, four, for the 404 villain, because it is an extremely low cost machine, I've gone with the lowest cost components. And going to the motors, going back onto low cost, these are the really low cost geared step motors that the, four, the, the 101 hero on Kickstarter is actually using. So they're called the 28BYJ-48 5 volts DC uh, step motors. They're geared and they're geared at a really weird ratio, like 1 to 63 or something. But they will work for a low cost printer, just. Um, and for the extruder, because I think these are too gutless, I'm going with, where's it gone? This thing, a just a proper NEMA 17. These are about $20 each. So you can see the difference in cost. These are about $2, $20. But this has the torque I need to drive filament forwards. And then the belts. So you could technically run a machine this low cost off braid. So there is some machines on, on, on Thingiverse that use braid, like fishing fishing braid, <laughs> to, to move the axes up and down using little spools on each end. It does work, it's very low cost, but again, belting is so cheap now. So this is just, uh, is this GT2? This, I think this is, no, maybe. I think this is actually five um, G5 millimeter belting, but I do have GT2 somewhere else, which is just finer pitch. And then step uh, timing pulleys. They're about a dollar each, about three dollars a meter. You know, extremely cheap. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I've got some other parts on the way from China. They will take a while. But that project is full steam ahead. I am going to make a knockoff of the 101 Hero, which is a Delta style 3D printer. And it's going to be low cost. And when I'm done, I'm just going to make the files freely online. And I'm using Onshape to do it. 
You might be right, actually, 1 to 16. I knew there was a 6 somewhere. But I think it was, thought it was much higher than 1 to 16. Uh, yeah, it's been a while since I've looked. It is a very high reduction, though. Okay, uh, Casey's actually saying something really handy, saying, Gamers Heaven 74 has a good video on testing your ramps board voltages with a voltage tester. That would, I would assume that would be to set your currents for your extruders, your, your, sorry, your stepper motor drivers. But, um, yeah, that's going to be a fun project. But, yeah, if you've got any questions, just fire away. Um, again, I've got... The, the be very creative, be the first. It's even the filament's yellow on it. Um, and I've got the Fabrica Mini running off the T10 uh, matter, matter control tablet, which, which is not doing anything at the moment. I'm just going to check why. Hold on. It said it was printing, but it wasn't printing. I don't know. I don't know how to feel about the, the T10 tablet at the moment. It seems to be a little bit buggy. Yeah, I got my, got my neon clothes on. Super comfy. Um, so, Jacob's asking, have I used Tinkercad? <laughs> yes. Uh, Tinkercad is awesome for very, very basic 3D modeling. And if you have never done 3D modeling before, you should use Tinkercad. Actually, why not? Why, let's fire up Tinkercad. I'll show you how much I use Tinkercad. I... <laughs> I've been using Tinkercad since it was on its own without being part of Autodesk. And if you have never done 3D modeling before, then you should give it a shot because it's pretty easy to use. I've taught primary school kids who have used Tinkercad and they've been able to use it fine. So you can see just how much stuff. I have like seven pages of things. I mean, lots of them are just useless. But <laughs> it is actually really handy for man manipulating STL files as well because you can pull them into Tinkercad and then cut away from stuff in Tinkercad. And it's really easy to do. I used to run, oh yeah, a training class as well. So lots of <laughs> these 3D printing pens. A lot of those actually. But yeah, it's, it's really fun to use. It's easy to use. And if you use proper 3D modeling software, you might get frustrated because it's super basic but it is simple so if you've never done it before use Tinkercad start it out with it if you want something a bit hard, more hardcore I would recommend on shape to be honest if you want something cloud based yeah just lots of it saves everything you do so just got lots of random stuff in there <laughs> yeah I'm using all the Australian slang, so when I say fire it up, I mean like turn it, like get onto the website. And when I say I'm looking at, like going to have a squiz at something, it means I'm going to look at something. You'll, you'll understand it eventually. Uh, Lurie Studios is asking, Craftware or Cura? I haven't used the latest Cura. I don't really have a need to, but the latest Craftware is very nice. Why don't we fire it up? <laughs> My computer has so many slicing programs on it. It probably has, uh, I would say, 10 different slices on it. And they all interact with each other horribly. Yeah, so the latest Craftware is really, really quite nice. Uh, get rid of that thing. No. Delete. Add. Let's see if we can add something random. That. So this is a pretty awful file. Um, but 
Where drop? Move. Drop. There we go. Let's go to supports, because the supports in Craftware are awesome. So we can auto-generate them. And if we go down to the bottom, you can see it's made some there, but you can add them in. So you can... There you go. Add in supports as you need them. If there's a specific overhang that it's, it's missed, you can add them in. Uh, this is a straw for something. Don't don't ask. <laughs> it's it's not a flashlight. It's for some other random project. Um, and then G code, and we can slice it. The slicing in Craftware is really fast, blindingly fast, and it shows you like previews of what you're changing. So like the extrusion width, and then like how fast it moves. Awesome. Also has vase mode as well. There you go. Slices really quick, and you can check out all the layers like that. So yeah, I mean, if you're looking, if you're looking for a free alternative to Simplify 3D, and you're not sure you need to, you want to invest in something that hardcore yet, try out Craft Craftware definitely. <laughs> Electric Plasma's like, why did I not know of this software? It's really unknown. Like, Craft Unique are based in Budapest in Hungary. They make the CraftBot, which is a fantastic printer. And then they make this software, which is open. It's not open source, but it's open in terms of you can make G-code for any printer using it. And no one knows about it. They're all, like, using Cura still. Like, Cura's had its day. I'm, I mean, I know them's fighting words, but this is so much more powerful. Uh, there is Windows, Mac, and Linux, I believe, for this. I think there is, it's everything supported. Uh, oh, unlikely creators asking about Joel's huge print from the part, Daddy. Yeah, if you haven't seen Joel's channel on 3D Printing Nerd, go check him out. He may, he didn't make it, but he got given this humongous failed print from a, a giant delta called the part, Daddy, which takes in PLA pellets and melts them out of an extruder like almost like an injection molding machine and he has this failed print that's like as tall as him <laughs> I mean wouldn't that suck you have a print that's so huge and you use so much material and then it fails oh dear uh, yeah so Lurie Studios is asking should I invest money to simplify 3 or keep using Craftware look if Craftware is fulfilling your needs then there's no reason to upgrade but if you start actually making some money off 3D printing and actually want to invest in the the sort of the processes that uh, Simplify 3D gives you then it's definitely worth investing in. I mean 150 bucks in terms of the term in terms of the overall printer cost isn't really that much if you can if you consider it that way. So I always use Simplify 3D if I can. But I already got it. So that's yeah, it's hard to hard to say it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have gotten some prints of Craftware that look a bit rubbish and then I've printed exactly the same settings of craft with Simplify 3D and then found like the Simplify 3D print was just flawless. I'm not sure why that was, maybe something I missed. But the, the ability to have editable supports for free is nice. <laughs> Brandon's quoting himself. If you've got the money for Simplify 3D, it's worth the money for Simplify 3D. Cool. Uh, so, Waffle Man, you didn't miss too much. We've talked about uh, my updates on the 404 Villain 3D printer that I'm designing, which is a ripoff of the 101 Hero. I showed you some stuff in Simplify 3D. And what else did we talk about? The, the Olo update. <laughs> And uh, the palette as well, which looks really cool as, as a way to join filaments together. Uh, JTDV asking, I have a Flexion extruder, but I don't have any flexible filament to try. What should I, what kind should I try? So the Flexion extruder was designed by the guys that made NinjaFlex. So if you're not sure what to get, I would go with NinjaFlex because they, they designed it. <laughs> so it should work with theirs. But if you can get any sort of aftermarket TPU, I mean, I've got some stuff just from China. As long as it's good enough quality, you should be fine. Don't go for the super flexible stuff yet. Um, I think there's a new one called Cheetah, which I think might be from the Ninja Flex guys. I'm not 100% sure. That looks really good. The the No on Pedro over at Adafruit tested it out. And that looks like it prints well as well. So 
yeah, I'd go with the cheetah or the just the regular ninja flex to start out with. Cool. Uh, and Keaton's asking one of my feelings about the CTC printer. I get asked about them all the time. I don't really look at them very much because some people get good results and then some people just have a machine that's basically a big paperweight. And that tends to be the problem with these clones of clones from China where the quality control is very, very low. So you're going to be probably up for a lot of a very steep learning curve to keep it going. I'm not saying they don't print. They do print. The original replicators printed but they are very much full-on hands-on machines. They are not going to just print and just leave them and then print and leave them. Like You'll need to keep keep on them. But they are cheap. So if that works for you, then, then that works for you. Uh, and Liam's asking about the Robo 3D. I actually haven't tried one myself, and I've heard the newest ones are really, really good. So I think... I'm not sure who has one that I know. Chuck? No. I, <laughs> I'm sure someone on YouTube has one. But um, yeah, I've heard pretty good things. They are an open design though. So yeah, I tend to be more leaning towards closed designs if I'm looking for a printer with a heated bed that I want to do stuff like ABS. But if you have your PLA, I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure you can print massive prints, no problem. Yeah, but I haven't used one myself. Cool. Uh, yeah, Lurie's asking what budget PLA filament I recommend. So I've recently tested out the Hobby King stuff, which is like sixty, sorry, sixteen dollars a kilo shit, and then and then shipping. So maybe twenty five dollars Australian per kilo shipped, and it actually works pretty well. I'm sure there's some quality control issues at that price point, but at the price, it's nuts cheap. And I've been using Esun for years. I like Esun. It's cheap. And yeah, I mean, use whatever you can get, basically. The stuff that really just, if, if it's a brand that you've never heard of and it's just randomly from China, maybe avoid. But if you find people in forums have used it, you can't really go wrong. Filament's filament these days. There's not really much filament that just lit, straight out doesn't work. You, you'll usually get something that does function okay. <laughs> it's, it's very rare to come across filament that just doesn't function. Discard. Right, another question, question, question. Uh, Cameron's asking, should I back the Tico 3D printer? You're about two years too late, buddy. It's it's not on Kickstarter anymore, <laughs> as far as I know. You might be able to pre-order them, but I wouldn't pre-order a machine that still hasn't delivered from Kickstarter. That's just like throwing your money away. Um, yeah. <laughs> the actually, um, technology nerd. He has you have you've backed the Tico, dude. How is there any updates? I'd I'd like to know. They they were meant to be shipping soon, and I know there was some delays, but. I mean, this is a classic Kickstarter. Uh, Johnny's asking, have I had much experience with the Australian Bilby 3D filaments? Uh, I haven't used them myself. I do know a lot of people in Australia do use them. They, they work very, very well. They're fine. They are rebranded China filaments, but they're sold locally with local support and they print well. So nothing wrong with that. Yeah, okay. So, that, so apparently the Tico shipping in July. Well, that's only a month away. So we'll see how that goes. Yep, uh, Elf Tablet, the Mosaic Palette. I talked about that at the start of the stream, but I'll just go back on it quickly. I think it's an awesome idea. So the, for those who haven't seen the palette, I uh, might be able to pull it up again. There we go. So the palette is a machine that takes four different rolls of colored filament, all the same type. It has to be the same type of filament with the same melting temperature. Sorry, it has to be the same melting temperature, but it can be different types. That's the one. And it takes four different types and then melts them together and then prints through a single nozzle. It uses computer control to determine which colors goes where. It's a great idea. Um, Norm from Tested looked at it. I think it's fantastic. It's really expensive for what it is, about $1,000 for... I mean, it's got a lot of hardware in there. 
but I think it's a really expensive toy and not many people would really get the functionality out of it. I would personally be designing things in sections and then printing them in sections in color and then joining them together afterwards. That's how I'd normally do it. Like I'm doing with the, the Miku Hatsune um, print where it's different parts joined together. That's how I usually tackle it. That's cool, don't apologize. <laughs> Uh, oh, Casey's talking about bio nerds. That's actually interesting. There's a lot of biohacking groups popping up now. Um, there's one in Sydney run by a guy called Meow Meow. <laughs> and they do all sorts of crazy stuff. And it's awesome. So that's a whole nother frontier. I mean, I don't know anything about that. But the technologies do overlap. 3D printing technologies can be adapted into biohacking technologies, which I think is really, really cool. Yeah, so that's an yeah, interesting thing to bring up. What's a meow meow? It's a guy <laughs> called meow meow. Cool. So Robert's asking any opinions on filler dry or modifying a dehydrator to feed filament Oh, okay. Yeah, a few people are bringing um, dehydrators out in the market that are just rebranded into filament dryers. You, There's nothing wrong with that idea. You can't... With PLA, for example, it should be a balance. It shouldn't be too dry, where it can become even more brittle, and it shouldn't be too wet. There should be, like, a balance. So you can't just use, like, a just a off the, you know, off-the-shelf, really cheap dehydrator. I think that would actually make it worse. They're not a bad idea. I have never had to deal with that problem. I mean, I may be lucky being in Australia, but we don't really have extremely humid, at least indoors, the, the, the air is not very humid. So I don't really have an issue with my PLA degrading over time. I've had rolls open for half a year and I haven't had any issues. Nylon, yes. I think a, a dehydrator for nylon is a must. And if you do have it, you need it in a box of desiccant and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, Brandon's just saying now, I've got a huge bag of desiccant. That's what you need to do to keep um, to keep filament, to keep nylon dry. And polycarbonates. Polycarbonates absorb moisture as well. But PLA, personally, I've never done it. And I've never had to. Some people say they do. I think it's very much location-based where you are. I mean, if I lived in the tropics, like if I lived in Queensland, like where the humidity is very high during the summer months, I probably wouldn't need it. Sydney... Not a huge amount. <laughs> Unlikely creators. So I heard you say in a video that PLA isn't plastic. What's that about? All right. So a bit of a backstory. I did a video on the the Kickstarter project, which was the mini toy from Waste Tech. So they make the the idea work 3D printer. It looks like a an up two. Uh, yeah, up plus two 3D printer. But it's, it's a different company. They're not bad printers, but they've got this Kickstarter campaign, which is the mini toy, which is a kid-friendly printer. And I pretty much ripped it apart in that video. I said, I said it's not safe for kids. I said it looks terrible. It's a terrible approach. Um, and then this other guy took huge offense to it and went on a huge rant through their comments and then replied to every single comment in that video to people who had already commented, if that makes any sense. And he was saying stuff like PLA isn't a plastic and that an e-stop is a better idea than a lock. I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea. An e-stop's great. You can stop it after the accident's occurred. <laughs> so um, I kind of just sort of wrecked him by showing that on the, the vlog. <laughs> because saying stuff like PLA isn't a plastic is just pretty funny. Cool. Uh, what else? What else? Uh, that's a good question. So, JTTV is asking, what do I think of the future of Thingiverse? Hmm. Um, personally, I've stopped using Thingiverse mostly. I don't upload files to it. If I upload a file, I actually tend to upload it onto Gumroad and just make it zero dollars, as a lot of you guys will know. So, if you want to pay, you can, but most of them are free. The only thing I've ever charged for was the ebook. And at this point, I do that because I, I maintain control over it. I don't have a license on it. If someone went and decided to sell, I don't know, the, the Easter egg thing I did, I don't, 
I, there's no way I'd be able to stop it. And I think with Thingiverse, the whole hullabaloo about licensing and people selling stuff on eBay, look, you can't really stop it. And I know a lot of people got upset with me saying that, but that's sort of how it is. If you upload a file for free or upload anything digital, then you're going to lose control over it. Simple as that. But in terms of Thingiverse as a company, because they are owned by MakerBot and then by being owned by MakerBot are owned by Stratasys, I don't really know how they're going to... They'll keep the community going, but MakerBot itself is going super downhill. Their sales have slumped. I think they were selling something like six printers a day a few months ago, like worldwide. <laughs> and they're, they're moving operations to China. That's what killed the Solid Doodle press. That's Solid Doodle... Again, late news, but Solid Doodle went bankrupt a few months ago, and that's what killed them. They moved manufacturing off-site, and they just lost control over it. You lose control of quality control, and that's all MakerBot had going for them. Their parts were made in China, but they were still assembled in America. So, again, a tangent, but if MakerBot tanks, I think, Sol I think um, Thingiverse will follow shortly after. That's what I think about the future of Thingiverse. Uh, okay, well, cool. Pano's asking, how many printers do I currently have? So, good question. Um, no, it's more than that, Elf. It's more than five or six. I've got currently two up minis, which are my personal up minis. I have the original One How i3, which I don't use anymore because it's not very good. I have the Cocoon Create, which is much better. I have the up box. I have the, uh, the Fabricator Mini, which is mine. I have the Trinus, which is the pre-production Trinus, which works pretty well. Uh, how much? That's seven so far. I've got the Be Creative, which is not mine. I have the Robox, which is not mine. I have the M150, which I am keeping. Ten? Ten? Maybe one more so I can't think of? <laughs> no, I think it's ten. Ten machines at the moment, but not all of them are mine. They're, they're all just loners. Oh and oh and the TiVo Tarantula kit, which uh, hey Chuck, how's it going? Uh, yeah, I've got the TiVo Tarantula, and if you want to see how the TiVo Tarantula works, go to Chuck's channel because he's reviewed it, and he did a really good review on it, and it looks awesome. So I need to assemble that. That's what I've got going at the moment. Yeah, no one's going to buy the original i3. The original i3s, I I bought it like when they first came out, and they just they were just terrible. Like they don't heat up very well. The, the LCD is not very responsive. Uh, yeah. The, the, the V2 and then V3 are so much better. <laughs> Printer giveaway time. I do actually have something coming up which is going to be really cool. I do have a giveaway coming up. And it may involve a, another one how. Maybe with a six in the name. Wait for that. <laughs> Joel has more than me. Joel has like a room of printers in boxes he hasn't even had time to look at. Um, but it's a problem. I mean, I want to do lots of reviews, but I also want to do lots of projects and reviewing printers takes a long time. That's why I'm sort of multitasking. Oop. With the, yeah, the be, the be the first. I'm not, the be the first is actually pretty good, but it doesn't have a screen on it. You have to do everything via the computer and that's a little tedious. <laughs> uh, what else? Electric Plasma, what's my favorite 3D, absolute favorite 3D print? Uh, I think my favorite 3D print is probably my most practical, which is this. So this is an iPhone 6 holder from my mini factory. I forgot the name of the designer, but it's, it's fantastic. The lightning cable slides in. I, I've been using this for a year. I did originally printed it on, this is done in rigid ink green, lime green, it's a really nice lime green PLA and I use this every single day so yeah that's probably my favorite because it's the most practical print I've ever done <laughs> and Lucas is asking how the Robo Wars went um, well my robot kind of caught fire semi uh, yeah. <laughs> it didn't drive very well because of the weight distribution it did destroy a printer, com uh, sorry another robot completely which was made out of chopping board because this was like a just a, an exhibition competition and I kind of felt bad because I didn't expect the flail to do any damage I expected it to make noise and look just chaotic and fun but not really do any damage but it smashed into this other robot 
and the whole top exploded and it damaged all these like drive motors and everything. And his son was driving it. He's like 10 year old son. And then afterwards I looked back and he was crying. <laughs> and I felt so bad because I didn't expect it to do any real damage, but it kind of totaled the whole top of his robot. So that was, that was pretty interesting. But apart from that, it didn't do that well. It, it was, it was fun to watch, but I definitely need to redesign it to have better, better control and better driving. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> oh, that's another one I didn't even mention. So, yeah, Pano's asking about the Rigibot 2. Okay, I guess I need to talk about the Rigibot 2. I have a Rigibot 2 as well. It makes it 11 printers I've got at the moment. And it's currently not functioning. And the reason it's not functioning is I got it shipped to me with very early firmware by um, Andrew from Disrupt It Yourself. He's got his own YouTube channel. Awesome guy. Definitely go check him out. He worked with me to get a Rigibot early on so I could sort of go through it and we could work together to get it, get it going nicely and then do a review on it. Then I got back in touch with him asking, you know, is there any update on firmware? And he said, basically, he wasn't with the company anymore. And I'm sure he's okay with me sharing this. And essentially, he'd left and a few other people had left. I don't really know the, the, what's going on inside of Rigibot. But I can't get an answer from my email. My emails to them are going unanswered. I did get some new firmware from one of you guys, one of the subscribers, when I did the Flexion Extruder review, which he said he's got, he's got his own custom firmware that makes the, the Rigibot 2 print flexibles, and I just need time to load it up. And if that works, then I'll get it going, because then I'll do a review on the Rigibot 2, because it's a fantastic design. It's just the firmware I have for it at the moment is just terrible. And I don't know, I don't have the time to write my own custom firmware and update it. So that's, that's where the Rigibot 2 is at the moment, which sucks because it's a great looking machine. <laughs> I, didn't trust, I didn't crush the child's dreams. I, I, I smashed the robot, but it, it was, he fixed it. The dad fixed it. It was okay, and the kid was okay at the moment. He was, a, he was a little chap. He was like, you know, you have a great robot and shook my hand. So that's awesome. And I'm going to see them again in August. There's another robot competition. So yeah. I mean, look, I've had my robots totaled constantly. I can't even remember how many I've had that have just been exploded and slatted across the arena. I love it. I just laugh. It's part of it. So it does take a little bit of a learning curve. <laughs> Uh, Catborg's asking, do I work at Adafruit? No, but if they're interested, they can get in touch. But Adafruit is an American company and I'm based in Australia. And time zones don't, don't line up. And they've already got No and Pedro doing awesome 3D printing things as part of the Adafruit universe. So, yeah. I, I, do, I do like supporting those guys. I stay up till 2am my time watching their streams. But I don't think I'm going to do, be doing too much with them just because it's, we're just too far away. <laughs> Uh, and Technology Nerd's asking, do I have any more thoughts on the Trinus? Look, to be honest, the Trinus I've got is already outdated. It's, it works. Uh, the, the Pango software is okay. It could be better. I do run it off other software like Repetia. It works fine. But the one I have is already outdated. They've updated the new extruder to be all metal. So it has no PTFE tubes, no inserts. It works great. And yeah, the, the, the Trinus team... Uh, just powering along. They're taking ideas and then putting them into practice. So the heat bed, people didn't like it being a separate unit, which was not controlled by the printer. Now it's going to be controlled by the printer, which is fantastic. And that's what a Kickstarter should be all about. So yeah, I mean, mine works, but it's sort of, it's done its, done its job. It's done the review. I've shown how the technology can work, how the hardware works. And now it's in the hands of the guys to manufacture it. I might be maybe going to China. I need to get my passport back. But if I do, that would be cool because I might be able to visit the manufacturing plant. I don't know. But I need to get my passport back from... It's been waiting for ages. It takes so long in Australia. <laughs> Am I stoned? No, I just... I squint all the time. And I sneeze because I'm allergic to everything so I have red eyes constantly. <laughs> That's... 
That answers that question. Cool. Oh, Casey's actually asking a good question. How expensive are those rails the Trinus uses? So, the, the Trinus guys weren't originally going to sell them separately, but I sort of convinced them that they were a useful manufacturing part for people to make their own systems. So, they're going to be about 100 bucks, from what I understand. Oh, I think if Bojan's still in the comments, he might be able to answer that. But they will be for sale, and they will be much cheaper than anything else on the market that does that sort of thing. <laughs> I have red eyes too, but I have stone. Excellent. Uh, Alex is asking, will I make music a music video one day? I like your sound, songs on SoundCloud. Oh, thanks, man. Um, again, music's kind of just a relaxation thing for me. I don't... I never really intended for it to be a source of profit or anything, which it won't be. But I, it's very much a private thing for me. I do it when I'm by myself late at night making songs. And I do use them in my videos because that way I don't have to worry about any sort of copyright. But in terms of filming myself making video, I feel a little bit uncomfortable doing it. I don't know. It's weird. It's sort of like... It's like playing computer games. Although I am filming myself now talking to all of you guys. So I guess maybe it will happen. I think the biggest issue would be making... Cubase talk to OBS because Cubase takes control of the sound card and I don't think they'd work together. But maybe one day if more people want to see it. Uh, Munchi's asking thoughts on the GTEC Prusa i3. So the GTEC Prusa i3 is exceedingly low cost. You can get it going but you're in for a long time long tedious process of assembly uh, calibration tweaking they do work but you're going to be spending a long time to make it work because if anyone's read my ebook what you pay for in a diy kit is with your time so if your time is free by all means get a kit and by all means get the gtech prusa i3 but if your time is not free then you might want to consider something a little bit higher end <laughs> and uh, oh, Phantom's asking, what do I think of PETG and will it ever replace PLA or ABS? A lot of people think so. So PETG is, you know, PET is the same stuff that water bottles are made out of. PETG is a little bit different. It's tough. It's slightly easier to print with than printing ABS. Though I have still had warping issues with some brands of PETG. But it's not... Like, if you print with PETG and you bend it to a breaking point then it will explode. It will shatter into a million pieces. Please wear safety goggles when doing this. It will literally just crack suddenly. And that's the difference between PET and ABS. ABS will do a... Uh, what's I think it's called a... Please don't... Oh, I'm going to be quoted on this. A ductile failure, I think, where it will craze and then bend, and then the more you bend it, it will eventually break. Um, whereas PET will shatter... And that what's make, that's what makes it not... Oh, okay. See you later, Pano. That's what makes PETG not as strong as ABS, in my opinion, because it doesn't have that tolerance to um, you know, deformation. But it is easy to print with. I still print with ABS all the time in the up box. It's what I started with in the up minis. I like ABS. It's stronger. It's a better plastic overall, but it is hard to print with. So, yeah. <laughs> that's, that answers that question. And PLA is never going to be replaced. It's a, it's a biodegradable plastic. It smells nice. And it's easy to print with. All these low cost printers I've got behind me are PLA only. The, the B the first doesn't even have doesn't even have a heated bed. It's just, just a plate of acrylic. And you can't even do um, PETG very easily on a non-heated bed. Cool. Yeah. Shotgun, you are late. I've only got about five minutes left. We've got to, got to cut it at one one o'clock precisely. Da 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 da. Uh, yeah, so Catboard's asking about the new Cura. Um, personally, to be honest, man, I haven't even played with it. Um, I just don't have the time to learn a new slicer when I know the other ones I use work so well. So I might look into it for a video, but Anthony over the hot end has already done that, so I feel like I'd be kind of copying, I guess, just looking at it randomly. But there is some other random slicers like Matic Control and... Um, what's it? 
There's a new one, Katana, which is like a super simple one. I might look at those, some more unknown ones, but there's already lots of videos on the new Cura. Something I, something I wouldn't really use because you need to make custom profiles using, I think it's using uh, editing an any file, something like that. But yeah, I just I like Simplify 3D. Yeah, you can't add the one hair without customizing it through uh, code essentially. And that's not something I do very often. Uh, Aurora Cypher, Form Labs 2, is it worth it? I, okay, so keep in mind I don't own an SLA printer and I have only ever used one once, which was the Asiga Pico Plus, which is a really nice DLP system. But the Form Labs 2 is amazing. From everything I've heard, it is extremely high quality, high resolution, the parts look amazing. But resin systems are messy. They need to be kept well looked after and you can't leave the resin in the in the tank for long. The tanks do, sorry, the, the vats do wear out. They're consumables. They're an ongoing cost. They're much more expensive to run than an FDM. But if you need the high quality, if you're doing small World of Warcraft figures, not World of Warcraft, what's the, War Warhammer. If you're making custom Warhammer figures or anything like that, those machines would kill it. You could print off custom figures cheaper than you could buy them. Definitely. <laughs> right, time for one, maybe one or two more, two more questions, dudes. Uh, so, obsolete, will I review the TiVo Tarantula? Yes, 100%, I will review it. That's why they sent it to me. So, look for that one soon. And, yes, Chuck's reviewed the, the Monoprice, which is the, the Malian M200, which was rebranded to the Monoprice Maker Mini, Maker Select Mini, something like that. Uh, definitely check out Chuck's channel to see his awesome reviews on that and the, the Tiva Tarantula and heaps of other low cost printers like the, the Fabricator Mini, stuff like that. Really, really good. And Ben's asking, do I play many other games other than Shiv? Oh man, I play so much chivalry. It is disgusting. <laughs> I'm like rank 60 now. Uh, but I do play Slime Rancher a little bit at the moment. That's a lot of fun. And I do play Ark Survival Evolved. So Ark is a... It's still an alpha somehow. It's a massive online uh, survival game with dinosaurs. Lots of fun, but kind of the persistence of it annoys me. I have to log in every week to make sure people don't take my dinosaurs. And I was looking at printing stuff out of it at one stage, but I gave up because it was too difficult. But I do play a bit of Ark. But that's about it. Ark, Shiv, Slime Rancher. Mostly Shiv. A little bit of Fallout, but not too much anymore. I kind of got distracted. All right, one more. <laughs> Stefan's asking, who is Chuck? Chuck's the guy in the chat, dude. Chuck Hellebuck's Electronic Products. Go check out his channel and subscribe. Right. Uh, and, oh yeah, one important question. Catborg, can you use Simplify 3D with the Up Mini? No, you cannot. You cannot use any other slicer on the Ups without hacking them. And you can technically pass other G-code through some sort of hacky community generated software. But other than that, you can only run the up software into the ups. And to be honest, the up software is pretty good. The only thing I miss is G code preview. So I am hoping they will add that to the new up studio. If they don't, then it's going to be the death of them because that's like mandatory now, but otherwise, no, you can't really do anything else on the ups except their own software. Cool. All right, guys, um, I got to head off. Uh, uh, oh, just before I go, no, I'm not planning to do any fan mail at the moment. I, I want for a start I'm in Australia, so it's really far away from most of you. And secondly, it's just I don't have a PO box and I can't share out my address. So not yet, but maybe in the future. So thanks so much for guys for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Sorry, today was a little bit random. I mean, I still hope I answered your questions nicely. And I will be reviewing the, the Be The First this week, as well as starting to put together the TiVo Tarantula as well, which is a really nice looking kit. And again, thank you so much to all of you guys on Patreon. I am so thankful that you've been supporting me to do this because as I say every week, this is the only way the stream's possible using 4G internet. It's not possible any other way. I know Anthony at the hot end recently got NBN, Tessa over at Sparky Face 5 has NBN, which is fast internet. It's never coming to this location. And this is the only way I can stream like this. So thank you so much guys for watching. 
And I look forward to seeing you again very shortly here in Makey's Views. See you later.